This week's lecture explores how color is used in interiors. In the hands of a designer, color can be used to modify a space's proportions. It can be used to alter the way people might feel or behave in the space, in addition to making a space more pleasing to the eye. Color choices may be based upon their influence on perceptions of space, unity, emphasis, or psychological suggestion. Shapes and textures are part of the design process, but color also plays a major compositional role. Color can influence our spatial perception in many ways. Hues that are lighter appear larger, and those that are darker read as smaller than they may actually be. So I've got a couple of interiors here that use color in very um, purposeful ways. <clears throat> so this interior is obviously one from a past era. This is probably from about the late 1950s, early 1960s. And in this space, we have a combination of functions within the room. We have a sitting area. Um, on the back right wall, we have a TV and bookcase with a uh, speaker system worked into it. And then on the left of the, of the rear of the image, we have a uh, atrium of sorts or a greenhouse of sorts. <clears throat> so the way that the designer has treated this is to unify the room with the common color scheme being for simplicity's sake, let's say blue, green, and orange. But if you look, they've divided the room up within those three colors to create certain sections or uses within the room. So in the foreground, we have that dark blue being used on the sofa and the floor to divide the space up without breaking it up with a physical boundary. So we've got blue in the foreground. In the background on the right, we've painted the entire wall of bookcases green. So that defines that area. And then on the atrium or the sunroom side, we have windows looking out to a landscape. So that defines that area. So in color and material, the designer has divided the space up, but color also helps to unify the interior. You'll also notice that the green toned floor helps to separate the room as well. So it's a good use of space it's a good use of color, and it defines the space into, into zones or areas without chopping it up too much. And having this interesting array of colors and layout makes the room more engaging. You kind of want to poke around and discover what's going on in the interior. The use of a single color for not only the walls, but the ceiling and floor also helps to quiet the space a little bit. The bookcase wall, while it is all one color and while it's very organized, there's a lot of different components. And if more colors were used, it would make the bookcase wall a little too noisy. And the same can be said for the ceiling. We have an exposed beam design, but if the beams were a different color than the ceiling plane, this too would add to a little bit of a noise in the interior. So by painting it all one color, we still have the architecture, but it helps to unify the space. Next up is another period room, if you will, this one also being from the 1960s. What the designer has done in this room is used color to not only unify the space, but also to balance the space out. So this room, we have the living room area in the foreground, the dining room in the background. You'll notice that the dining room ceiling is lower. It's probably about at least four feet lower than the living room ceiling. So in the living room, we have a nice vaulted ceiling giving us a lofty space, but the dining room is more intimate and cozy with that dropped ceiling. You'll notice that the designer has carried the same white in both spaces. They have not created a focal wall at the back of the dining room. If you could imagine the dining room wall where the candelabra is being painted a bold color, 
while that would be eye-catching in the grand scheme of this interior, it would make the dining room ceiling look even lower. So what the designer has done is paint all the walls the same color so that it creates the illusion of height. Obviously, when you step into the dining area, you'll know that the ceiling is lower, but from afar, it creates uniformity. Also take a look at the window coverings. We have floor to ceiling French pleat drapes in a pattern. I, I think it's a star pattern, but it could just be dots but floor to ceiling in both spaces. It's really helpful in the dropped ceiling area of the dining room because all of those folds in the drapery creates vertical lines, which draws your eye up. So having drapes in that style creates the illusion of height in a lower ceiling area. And treating both sections, both rooms with the same material again helps to unify the interior. In the foreground of the living room, we have a dark blue carpet, some either light gray or white sectional sofas, and then our blue and white color scheme is continued through with accent pillows. So the, rooms, the room is predominantly blue and white, treated in a fairly modern way. We do have some modern shapes on the furnishings, the coffee table, the minimal paint scheme, and then we have those floor to ceiling drapes. So a pretty clean presentation. You know, the drapes aren't covered up in valances or anything that would make it look a little too ornate. And even in modern interiors, window coverings do have a place. This is not really what we would call modern today, but window coverings do help to insulate our interiors. They help to protect our flooring and our textiles from being damaged by UV rays. And they do add a certain amount of architecture to the space. You can see that the designer by taking these drapes in the living room all the way to the ceiling, they've actually created the illusion that the window is bigger than it is. You can see as the sun comes through the window in the lower portion, we have the light filtering through, but up above there's no light coming through. But when the sun's not out or if this is in the evening, it creates the illusion that we have these huge floor to ceiling windows, which has a nice dramatic effect. The white of the color scheme keeps the space feeling open and fresh. And then we have grounded it with these dark blue rugs. So we've created contrast and visual interest. Sometimes an all white space can be a little bit boring. So always good to have something in there to act as a foil to create some dynamic um, qualities to the interior. In a more contemporary image here, we have turquoise blue and orange reacting very nicely together. And then they're set against a neutral backdrop. So this is something that can work if you want to introduce color or if you have a client that wants to introduce color but you don't want them to feel that they're committing to too much. So by having a neutral background, in this instance, it's a damask wallpaper, but it could even be a neutral paint. It allows you to add color in the form of accessories. So here we've got orange ginger jars and flowers on the dining table. They did commit to turquoise blue upholstery, but upholstery can change. And because you use it so much, it, it does need to be changed after a certain amount of years. I think the biggest commitment is the turquoise blue Murano glass chandelier, because that would have been a very large investment in the interior. And that's not something you could... <clears throat> easily trade out due to the cost. But we've got some interesting punches of color, but it's all set against a white and neutral background so that the colors are sort of tempered against that neutrality. And the client would not feel that there is too much color going on because even though some clients want color, actually I think most clients want color, they are still afraid of it. They're afraid they're gonna do too much. They're afraid, I hear a lot that that they're afraid they'll get tired of it, you know, get tired of blue or get tired of orange. But wouldn't you get tired of beige as well? So as designers, we have to introduce our clients to new ways of thinking and also point out the rationality of certain design decisions. When a color expands visually, 
it may also seem closer to the viewer than those that seem to contract, leading to the common statement that warm colors, which are red, red orange, orange, yellow, and yellow orange, advance, while cooler colors, blue, blue, green, green, blue, violet, and violet, recede. So here we have another modern interior, contemporary to our age. We have this idea that cool colors recede, warm colors advance. That's kind of a, a textbook, old school way of thinking about color. Today, we've broken a lot of the rules that older designers or designers that have come before us have learned because modern design wants to be contemporary. We don't want to rely so much on the old ways. We want new interpretations. So in this room, we have a cool color palette in that we are using blue and oatmeal. In theory, the blue being cooler should recede meaning walk, you know, go away from us, make his face feel bigger. But in application, what's happening is the dark blue used on the walls is actually advancing, it's coming forward. This is because the color is a darker color and darker colors do advance. So color temperature are warms and cools, that's not always the case, but I think that darker colors do advance. What makes the blue advance even more is that the other two walls that we see in the image are white. So our eye is focusing on this blue and pulling it forward. You can see that the blue is carried through in the upholstery and the accessories, but why would the designer want to pull that back wall forward? Here's why. This room is a big rectangle. In the foreground, we have a sofa and chairs and an ottoman. In the background, you can see that we have two pendant light fixtures and two game tables. Those could also be used as dining tables, but they are set up as game tables. So because that blue is on the back wall and coming forward, we don't notice how deep the room really is. But looking at the picture now a little more analytically, we have a seating area in the foreground. We have two tables in the background, which are at least 40 inches square. And then if you look behind the sofa, there's two chairs. So this is a deep room to be able to get all that furniture in. The reason the designer has put a dark blue on the back wall is because rooms that are square are more pleasant to be in. Rooms that are rectangular can sometimes feel off balance. So the designer is painting the back wall of a rectangular room blue to pull that wall forward optically to make the room feel like a perfect square. We like being in rational balanced spaces. So in this instance, color is being used to balance the space. The room is filled with light, so we're not concerned with that dark blue wall being a problem. We've got windows on both sides. And then if you look through the drapery on the dark blue wall, there's actually another room beyond that. There's a sun room back there. So this room is plenty big, has plenty of light, so we can experiment with color more safely. But that's what the designer has done and why they chose to do it. And as I said, when you look at this, you don't notice it all. You look more at the blue and see how it kind of dominates the field of vision. But when you start taking it apart, you can see why they did the blue. The designer has also done some intelligent things in this room to help, again, bring a sense of balance. In the foreground, you'll notice that the lamps flanking the sofa match, but notice that the tables don't. Most people are compelled to do matching tables in rooms, but you don't have to do that. If you want to add variety, you can mix your tables, but just make sure that the heights are the same. The designer has also kept the drapery rods at the same height. So they have pulled the rods up to the crown molding on the windows on the left and right. And this is, I think, a best practice because it helps your room to feel even taller. On that back blue wall, they chose to keep the drapery rod at the same height as the windows on either side. They had some more room, they could have gone taller but it's a good idea to keep all of your drapery rods at the same height for uniformity. 
if anything breaks from the eye line that the drapery rods make up, it needs to be significant. That wall is already painted blue. We've already drawn attention to the wall. We don't need more attention drawn to that area. So they've kept the drapes at the same height to create a sense of formality and uniformity. <clears throat> so those are some smart designer tricks. Even if those lamps by the sofa were different, they would still be brought together by the fact that they might be the same height. So always consider those eye lines, consider a little bit of balance, even if you're going for something more, more contemporary, more modern and minimal, you still have those elements that, that are steadfast rules of design. Warm colors are considered engaging, cheery, active, positive, cozy, and stimulating. However, using large areas of saturated warm colors may cause people to feel irritable. Cool colors feel relaxing, restful, and soothing, but also may leave rooms feeling cold, unfriendly, and lacking variety. There are always exceptions to the rule, but an awareness of these color effects is useful. Small interiors can be made to feel larger by avoiding large areas of warm color, which tends to fill the space visually. So here we have a dining room. This is a Ralph Lauren dining room. And the room is this dark eggplant purple. And it's actually not paint, it's textile that's on the walls. So here we have an exception to the rule. We have a room that's being painted dark and it does make the room feel cozy, but it also adds a bit of drama. There's very little of that dark color actually being shown because there's so many books and pieces of art on display. That dark color serves as a background to everything that's going on. So you can see the white spines of the books, the black and white photos, and what helps this room not feel dark because we feel, as I said, that dark colors make a room feel more enclosed, can make things feel a little too claustrophobic perhaps. What makes this a successful room, in my opinion, is all of the reflective surfaces, silver frames, silver metal light fixtures, mirrors, accent lighting, the, the crystal and, and of course silver pieces on the table are for the setup, but there's lots of points of light, whether it is light coming from a light bulb or whether it's light being reflected off of a glossy or mirrored surface, there's lots of light. This of course illuminates a room, but this is another designer trick. The more points of light you have in a room, the more the room's occupant's eye will bounce around. So they'll go from the sconces to the chandelier, to the mirror, to the um, picture light, to the glass top table, to the nail heads on the chair. The eye goes towards light. It is something that is instinctive. The more your eye moves, the more your eye tells your brain that this is a large space with lots going on inside of it. So it creates the illusion of space just by having a lot of different light sources within an interior. So that's what's going on here. We have a dark color, we have black upholstery, there's an oriental carpet, there's mahogany furniture, but the room still has a lot of light because of all of those reflective surfaces. This is why people love putting mirrors everywhere. It's not solely for vanity, it's also because mirrors replicate light, they enlarge the room, they create the illusion of space. So keep that in mind when you're doing a design. The light, the eye goes, goes towards light. So think about lamps and reflective surfaces. A high ceiling can be made to appear lower by painting it in a color that advances optically. So in this interior, which again is contemporary to our age, we have a New York brownstone, no, not a brownstone, a New York apartment with a very high ceiling. It's a pre-war building, which is very desirable. And the designer chose to paint the ceiling chocolate brown to drop it down. Why would they want to do this? So that the room feels more intimate. High ceilings are usually saved for 
formal spaces. They're usually emphasized in formal spaces, but if you want a space to feel cozy, you're not gonna feel cozy with a 12 foot ceiling. So the designer painted it brown to pull it down a little bit in the room. They also made the ceiling feel lower by painting horizontal stripes on the wall. That horizontality creates a sense of width, which makes the ceiling drop even more. So in this room, they wanted more of a cozy, intimate feeling, and that ceiling was throwing things off. So by doing that, they're able to drop it down. And if you ever decide you don't want your ceiling dark anymore, you can just paint right over it. It's not a radical modification to the architecture of the building. It's a can of paint. Mind you, if you're painting over a dark ceiling like this, it's a can of paint and three coats of primer, but still, it's more cost-effective than, than a remodel. So that's what the designer wanted to do here. Technically, neutral colors are gray, white, and black because they are without an identifiable hue. These fall into the previously discussed achromatic palette. Colors falling midway between the warm and cool color groups, such as beige, brown, taupe, cream, ivory, charcoal, and off-white, off-white being any white with any small amount of color added, are called neutralized colors. As discussed, they are important to almost every color scheme. They tend to be restful, tranquil, livable, and unobtrusive and supportive. Yet if not used effectively, they can produce feelings of boredom and wariness. So here's boredom and wariness. I will start by saying, in the defense of the owner of this interior, they did not have an interior designer. This room has not been well laid out. This room has not been well lit, accessorized, anything like that. It's a beige box with a enormous sectional sofa in it. But this room is pretty boring. They did their best pulling the color of the walls out of the stone fireplace. I will give them that. But the only variety in the color assortment is coming from that fireplace. They haven't chosen the right neutral for the sofa. They haven't chosen the right neutral for the accessories. They haven't mixed wood tones. The only wood in the room is the floor. And then that detention chair over in the corner. So you can do neutrals, but you need to add variety to it. Also, this room could be a great interior, but all they have done is drop a sofa opposite the TV. You can see that the fireplace is completely useless to them. It doesn't even have gas logs in it. It's just a hole in the wall. And they decided to put the TV there. A interesting furniture arrangement in this room could add a lot to it. Window coverings could add a lot. And then more furniture besides a coffee table, a detention chair, and a enormous sectional would add a lot to the room. As long as we're talking about it, that chandelier is hung way too high. It's not illuminating the space. It's not part of the group. It's just sort of floating up there like a church bell. It needs to be dropped down. The window coverings, or rather the lack of window coverings, present a problem too. If this is a TV room and you want to watch your precious television, you would want to control the glare. And in this instance, there is nothing but glare in the room because there's nothing on the windows. So a good designer can really turn your game around. So this is our boring neutral room. And here's our well done neutral room, in my opinion. This room dates to the 1970s and it showcases neutrals, but I think it showcases them very well. We have a variety of neutrals in the raw silk upholstery of the sofa, the stone inset on the coffee table, the woven seagrass rug, the paint, and even that dark bitter chocolate brown. All of those neutrals work together beautifully. They're all tied together with those African textile pillows. Even the books take on a neutral appearance. They add a nice texture to the wall as well in that grid of beautifully constructed bookcases. The room is orderly. 
it's well organized. We have ample seating. If you consider that we could have three on the sofa, three on the day bed and two in the chairs, and then two more on the stool and chair, there's plenty of seating in the room. We didn't have to do a giant sectional to add enough seating. And it has a warm feeling without feeling boring. So this is a good example of how to use neutrals. Another important facet of using neutrals is to use texture with them. So we have the woven texture of the rug. We have the natural veining of the stone topped coffee table. We have the woven texture of the upholstery used on the seating. So there's a lot of interest. It's not just one flat color. Depth can be found through the use of visual texture. Colors also give a suggestion of a certain weightiness or lack thereof. Generally, Highly saturated colors or busily detailed areas will draw attention and seem to carry more weight than less saturated colors or simple areas. Here's a great example of busily textured areas. This is the home of the late Gloria Vanderbilt, who was the American socialite, the mother of Anderson Cooper, the heiress to the Vanderbilt fortune. She dabbled in a lot of things, art, interior design, fashion design, and she used her home as, an, as a, uh, a laboratory for interiors. In the 1970s, she collected American quilts. And this room is done with the inspiration from the quilts that she collected. So we have quilt drapes, there's a quilted pattern on the floor, there's quilted wall stenciling, insets in the door. It's a lot. But you can see how all of these colors are working together. We're optically blending them. And also the more densely patterned areas are attracting our attention. So the floor and the drapes, while the areas that are less decorative, such as the walls and the doors are providing a bit of relief. Also working to the advantage of the room, the upholstery that we see is solid. She has not brought in any patterned upholstery. It's all solid velvet and linen, again, to give us relief from all of the busyness. Now, this might not be your cup of tea. This certainly does do a good example of showing what I'm trying to illustrate, but I think we can all agree that this is a great novelty. It's definitely a memorable space. Here in this interior, we have kind of the opposite. We have a lot of quiet textures with the wood grain and the woven material set into the ceiling panels. We have the brick on the floor. We have the woven seagrass. So this one's quieter. Our eye does go towards the textures, the way that the light and shadow work with it. But this room has a lot of texture, but it's, it's pretty subdued. All the textures are kind of the same color. It works well together, but it doesn't have that noisy quality. In some cases, we intentionally create a feeling of imbalance with the help of color, or we use color to regain the balance of an interior. So in this example from the 1970s, we have a room that interestingly wants to emphasize the ceiling height. And when I say interestingly, it's the way that the designer goes about it. The major furniture pieces in the room are very low to the ground. If you have a interior that has a low ceiling, you know, eight foot or less, and there are some interiors that do have lower ceilings, like let's say you're doing a, um, a basement conversion. You might have a ceiling at seven feet down there. If you want to make a ceiling feel higher, one of the easiest things to do is put in low furniture. So that sofa, that coffee table, even that chair is pretty low. If you want to make the ceiling feel even higher, put in vertical elements. So behind the sofa, we have an art installation of vertical strips of color, which emphasizes the ceiling height or creates the illusion of it. And then next to it, we have a very tall column with a terracotta lion on top of it. This too creates a strong vertical thrust. Our eye follows up 
and we focus on the line on top. So this emphasizes and creates ceiling height. This can be, to me, it's a sense of imbalance because that furniture is so low, but to the designer, it could have been a sense of balance because they wanted the room to feel maybe more square or more cube-like. Here in this contemporary image, the designer has used color equally throughout the space. It creates a balance within all the interiors that we see. This, if you did not know, is a model home. If you've ever been on a model home tour, you might know that they um, these developers hire interior design firms to decorate the homes on the inside and they choose a palette, they choose all the furniture, they make it look perfect, almost like a showroom. And this model home looks just like that. It looks like a Z gallery on the inside. In my opinion, they've used some colors too frequently. Granted, this is a achromatic interior. There's no color being used outside of a grayscale black and white, but it all matches too much in my opinion. It would be nice if there was some punctuation, you know, some little pop of color outside of a house plant in the dining room. But in using all of the same colors, they create unity, but that can be pushed a little too far. It, in this instance, I feel it's unity to the point of being camouflage. Everything seems to blend in together too much. Granted, we have the black cabinets of the kitchen, but still there's not enough variety in here, in my opinion. I think more so than the black and white scale, the biggest sin is the fact that the kitchen cabinets don't go to the ceiling. You can see that the designers have put tchotchkes up there, which are only going to collect dust. But it's best to have your cabinets go to the ceiling because look at all that storage you're missing out on. The reason that they don't go to the ceiling is because that would be a custom size and that would cost more money. Cabinets that are a standard height are cheaper and more readily available. So this is why they didn't go up that high. But honestly, I would rather have that extra storage, even though you can't access it easily. That would be great storage for, you know, paper towels and your crock pot that you thought you'd use all the time and haven't used but once. Be nice to store it up there. But in this instance, we have color being used evenly. It is balanced, but you don't really know what, you know, where one room starts and stops, especially as you look further back into the image. Either way, the sense of balance and imbalance is achieved largely through the manipulation of the elements of design, such as symmetry, light and dark contrast, intensity of color, and so on. Colors affect each other so strongly that there is no absolute statement about relative visual weight that would apply to all cases. Other types of color balancing is designed to satisfy the viewer's sense of aesthetic proportions. These relationships have been translated by some color theorists into rules for proper color use in which color temperature, hue, and quantities are all in balance. We have studied these color schemes in previous lectures, but they are designed to give order and balance to any room, no matter the color. Throughout the world, many objects are identified by their coloring. However, colors have different meanings. Green is usually is universally accepted as a sign of nature, freshness, or ecology. Green Day is celebrated in Japan because Emperor Hirohito loved gardens. To the Muslims, green is a sacred color, and to the Celts, green was associated with fertility. In Western culture, white is associated with purity and piety, yet in many Asian cultures, it is the color of mourning. In China, white is also symbolic of light, while red symbolizes happiness and is used at weddings. In ancient China, yellow had religious significance. In ancient Greece and Rome, red was thought to have protective powers. Purple was a color reserved only for nobility due to its expense. African cultures take their colors from the land with palettes of yellow, ivory, and green. These colors represent strength and independence. There are a couple of theories 
in Eastern culture that pertain to the use of color. One of them is shibui. This expresses in one word the Japanese approach to beauty as well as the intrinsic nature of Japanese culture. It suggests an appreciation of serenity and a protest against ostentation. Belief in the power of the understated and unobtrusive dominates this philosophy. To produce the shibui effect, colors are brought together to enhance each other in a harmonious whole that will be deeply satisfying to live in for a long time. Schemes must have depth and complexity or they will become tiresome. Color is based on nature. Color found in the largest areas are quiet and undemanding, so they're neutralized. Bright, vibrant colors are found in small portions, proportions. Nature has thousands of colors, but none of them match or are uniform. The darker, more solid colors appear underfoot, and as one looks upward, color becomes lighter and more delicate. Most of the natural landscape shows a matte finish with very little reflectivity. Reflectivity such as the sun sparkling on a body of water, for example. Pattern and texture in nature are everywhere, but they have to be discovered through close examination. No two patterns are identical, yet unity prevails. Although natural colors, textures, and patterns appear simple, on close scrutiny, they prove highly complex. So here we have a shibui color scheme. So with these ideas in mind, large, large amounts of neutralized color, fine detail upon close inspection, darker color used at the base with color getting lighter as the eye travels up, lighter colors happening because more light is mixing with the color. We have a color palette such as this. So this is a close up of a tropical leaf and from afar, the leaf may appear green, but when you get up close, you can see the dark purples, the greens, the pinks, and even some blue. Here we have a interior inspired by Shibui. This is a very clean, simple, organic feeling space. We have a lot of natural, neutral colors being used. The colors that are identifiable are very soft. So we have creams and light wood tones in the foreground, but at the back, our kitchen cabinet is a very soft blue gray, almost like a foggy blue. So our colors are not strong within Shibui. They are natural, they are easy to live with, and they're restful. This is also a very light filled space that again is very sparsely ornamented. You can see the exposed staircase, we do have a, a lovely wood finish on the ceiling, um, as well as wood paneling on the kitchen doors, but it's a very open, restful space. And we see designs like this, not just in Asian design, but also in Scandinavian design. But this one is more of a Japanese shibui ideal. And the second image also shibui, but this one a little more refined. We still have those organic elements. We still have lighter coloring, but this one features more upholstered furniture, more formal style furniture. And then we have this really lovely asymmetrical arrangement of decorative objects on the focal wall next to that cabinet. But this, even though the space is a little more formal and maybe more expensive looking, it still embraces those principles of simplicity, neutral colors, judicious accessorization, and color, bold color in small doses. Another popular Eastern philosophy on the use of color, as well as the design of space, is feng shui. This ideology is based on several ancient Chinese philosophies and practices. One system, the compass mythology, is rooted in the pa kwa, an eight sided symbol that corresponds to the four compass directions and their subdirections. Color schemes are interpreted differently for each individual based on their birth year, which also relates to the person's basic elements of earth, water, wood, fire, and metal. For example, 
green represents wood. Therefore, someone born in the year of wood might use green as a color scheme. The person would avoid red, which is associated with fire, because fire destroys wood. White is highly valued because it is associated with light. Black is used selectively. Because it represents water and money, it is valuable to the interior, but it is also the opposite of light and should be applied carefully. Another overlying principle of feng shui is the appropriate balance of yin and yang, which represents a balance of complements or dualism. Successful feng shui color schemes create a harmony of these balances. So here's our color compass with our earth elements or our elements in general broken into five sections. And you can see the colors recommended for those born in years of water or metal or earth. So earth, of course, will have our earth tones of beiges and yellows and some warm pinks. Wood will have greens and browns. Fire will have, interestingly, a mix of not just warm colors like yellow, orange, and red, but also some cooler colors like lavender and violet. Water, of course, is blues and greens. And then metal is grays and whites. And here, a feng shui kitchen. So this occupant would have been born in the year of wood. We have a lot of wood being exposed. We also have the natural elements of the brick wall, as well as the wood floor and the wood seats on the bar stools. So it's very woody. The designer has added pops of yellow, as well as silver and gold. Um, silver and gold represent money, you know, a wish for abundance. So they have channeled that or interpreted it as these glass pendants above the peninsula. So you're not just putting the colors of your year, you're also putting in other colors to represent symbolic elements that you want to have in your life. For example, if you put red in a certain corner, that would be your relationship corner. And as long as you have red in there, that will welcome in positive, healthy relationships and love. So a lot of color is tied up in this ideology too. A strong consideration for designers is the desire to emphasize certain areas of a room, drawing them immediately to the viewer's attention. Sometimes an object calls attention to itself through contrast with its surroundings. Brightly colored sculptures stand out against dull urban environments. Using an open palette, which would be choosing hues from all parts of the color wheel, at high saturation, we cannot help notice the work. This will work just the same for hues that are low saturation, but the effect will be more subtle. So here, an open palette. What makes all of these colors work together is that they are the same intensity. They're the same vibrancy. So we've got reds and blues and greens and browns and yellows and all of these beautiful colors working together in these painted walls. But what makes them harmonize is their intensity. So we have depth and variety and interest, but it's not overwhelming. The designer has also done a great job mixing furnishings together. We have a Renaissance chair, a modernist sofa that's very low slung, a bronze coffee table, modern art and lighting mixed with antiques. It's really a beautifully curated interior. Again, that uses beautiful color. In the past, we have been taught that floors should be low in value and saturation so they would hide soil and provide an optically firm base. Walls should be light and neutral in hue to provide a value gradation from floor to ceiling and avoid clashes with color of furniture and paintings. Ceilings were to be very light in value to give a sense of spaciousness and reflect light. These limitations have not inhibited current designers. If anything, contemporary design works against those rules of thumb in every way. Colors are combined with abandon, new flooring materials have allowed for the use of light and dark floor finishes, and dark walls and ceilings are used to create cozy atmospheres and drama. 
color choices for interiors should be made under the lighting in which the material will be seen. Lighting is important in all design, but in interiors, it must be known in advance. The level of illumination affects the appearance of color. Bright light is often thought of as exciting while lower light can produce a relaxing feeling. Color may become dull in insufficient lighting and an overlit room can wash colors out. With this in mind, brightly lit rooms benefit from deeper light absorbing colors and dimly lit rooms show reflective lighter shades off better. One concern for the designer is how various quantities of natural and artificial light can change the visual perception of a surface, the phenomenon known as metamerism. For example, two fabrics match in color during daylight, but may not match under artificial light. All types of lighting will produce unique effects. So the way that fabrics would not match would most likely be attributed to their woven texture. If you have a fabric that's a velvet versus a satin, those are two distinct surface textures and they will reflect light differently. As far as types of light and their effects, incandescent light gives a soft, warm, golden glow, the same color temperature as candlelight. It's the benchmark for interior residential design. Cool fluorescent lights will emphasize blue-based tones, but be disastrous when illuminating warm colors. As expected, warm-hued lighting looks great on warm colors, but makes cool palettes look awful. Advances in LED technology and fluorescent lighting allows us to have full spectrum lighting, which replicates natural daylight. And natural daylight lighting is great to use in areas where you will be doing work, kitchens, bathrooms, offices. Natural daylight wakes you up. It makes you more alert, and it also shows full color rendering. So here we have one room lit with four different types of light. Look at how the colors change. We have the upper right, or rather the upper left room lit <clears throat> with a cool light. Or actually, this is lit with a bright white light, like an LED light bulb. And the colors look very bright, particularly the wall color. And you can see that the carpet is sort of this almond color. But then when we jump over to a warm light bulb, the wall color changes, the carpet color changes. So that image on the right looks like we've painted a completely different color on the wall. The lower right uses a cool light bulb, and this again changes the color. And then on the lower left, we have put in kind of a control by putting in a purple or pink light bulb, and you can see how the color changes that too. It's always good to use the same color of light bulb in your interiors whether you want warm or cool or daylight, please use the same color of bulb because it can be very distracting when one lamp is blue and the other lamp is yellow as far as the light given off. Historically, designers were educated to use bold saturated colors in small doses and large areas should be covered in subdued tones. Contrasting the earlier insistence for light colors Contemporary designers are using strong colors to create invigorating spaces and interiors that reflect the unique taste of the client. More than any other element, color is capable of setting the mood of a room. Strong chroma tends to create a feeling of informality. Soft neutralized hues are generally reserved for a more formal atmosphere. Because rooms are backgrounds for people, Color is generally most pleasing when not too demanding. General color moods can be evoked from specific areas of the home or office. The entrance hall introduces the home, the same way a reception area introduces an office or hotel lobby. The entrance area can effectively set the tone for the space. So provided you actually have a foyer or an entrance, it can introduce you to the home. One of my favorite movies for interior design is the film Anti-Mame with Rosalind Russell. The reason it's one of my favorite movies, if not the best movie for interior design, is because every 
change in her life is shown through her redecorating her fantastic apartment. When the movie opens and her nephew comes to live with her, it is entirely Asian art deco. So here is the elevator lobby to her apartment. So we can see black and white paneling on the walls. There's a dragon on the front door. When you open up the peephole where your eyes go, smoke comes out. That was just because there were so many people smoking at her party that it was billowing out the room. But this introduces you to kind of the fantastic interior that you're gonna be going into. So if you have the square footage to have a foyer, don't just write it off. Let it be an introduction to the design that you're doing. And when we get out there and we are practicing, most of our clients will have some sort of entryway because they are from a certain demographic and they will have an entryway that has a coat closet and some space for furniture because they live in homes that have a larger square footage. And towards the end of the movie, Mame goes more modernist. And so here's her entry foyer now with this kind of um, secessionist style wallpaper and a chandelier with goldfish in it. And then her living room has turned into this with lots of Danish modern nods and the use of the more restrained color palette and these fantastic amoebic screens that I would just love to have about 27 of because look at them, they're gorgeous. And then this room divider with the crystals, fantastic. Living areas generally have more neutralized color schemes that tend to produce an atmosphere of tranquility. Dining areas are at their best when color schemes are unobtrusive, permitting a variety of table decorations and a serene dining atmosphere. So these are, again, rules of thumb. They don't necessarily apply to everything, but the general idea is that more formal spaces do best with more subdued color palettes or neutral color palettes. Just depends on your client. But here we have a neutral color palette of grays and silvers and blacks really done beautifully in a very modern minimal setting. The lamp has a sculptural quality to it. The, the formality or the opulence of the room is really increased by the use of that silver leaf wallpaper, which not only reflects light, but gives a great texture and also a sense of luxury to an otherwise modern interior. We've also got this lovely marble floor that adds a sense of, of glamor and of refinement to a room that's very contemporary. Also nicely lit. Can we you know, give a little bit of credit to the lighting designer on this? Because the room is nicely lit but not overlit and that's hard when you have so many reflective surfaces. If this room was overlit, this would look like a skating rink because of all the light bouncing off of it. Here, a room that is done in color, which again, most people will say that should be safe for a more casual space, but the furniture arrangement makes the room formal. Whenever we have symmetry, we have strong sense of symmetry shown here, this gives a sense of formality. So the sofa is balanced by the chairs. We have a chair on either side of the sofa. So there's a strong sense of symmetry here and that gives a sense of formality despite the fact that the room is this beautiful persimmon color and this raisin color. Here, a formal living room done in a lighter scheme, but the furniture arrangement is more casual. So we've got multicolored pillows, throws over the arms, mismatched furniture pieces, a casual arrangement of art on the wall, yet the room itself is the formal living room, quote unquote, for the house but it's treated in a very casual English country way, still utilizing what we would consider a formal color scheme of these light or neutral colors. And then here, a formal arrangement with a more quote unquote formal color scheme with the lighter colors. And again, that formality being indicated by the strong sense of symmetry within the furniture. Even the fireplace is balanced by the windows, the sofas are equally balanced on either side of the, of the coffee table, and then the chairs kind of balance the fireplace. So it's a very rational, clean layout.
Informal living areas, such as family rooms, are often treated with more stimulating color schemes that create a casual environment. Kitchens are more desirable when large areas of color are light, fresh, and clean looking. Here in this contemporary interior, we have used just about every color we could lay our hands on. And it certainly creates a very fun, exciting space. The colors come from the rug, which is seen on the left, and we've painted the walls this beautiful sort of bright tomato red. The artwork on the wall echoes the colors of the carpet. And then we have some bold choices for upholstery, particularly that kiwi green used on the sofa and chairs but color creates excitement. And I think that we can agree on this. Again, whether it's your taste or not is one thing, but it does create a sense of excitement and happiness when you see a, a color scheme like this. It's almost, um, almost childlike, our response to it. Even though it's been very carefully selected, you know, each color has been chosen with intention, it still gives this sense of fun. And that's used most, most effectively in more casual spaces. Here, an informal family room done in more somber colors. Remember, we had said that what makes colors harmonize nicely together is that they are the same intensity. So here we have this English country look with these darker, warmer colors. The room is still set up in a casual configuration with the placement of furniture. The furniture itself is more traditional, but we have a nice layered uh, um, effect from the textiles. The textiles all go together nicely because of the colors that are being used. And in this instance, we have, again, a variety of color, which also adds a sense of informality, um, but it's not as bright as the one we saw before. So we can still have warmer tones and still get that cozy informal feeling. And then here, a very casual uh, family room done in neutrals. Remember neutrals, they say, are best suited for formal spaces. But here in this more modern transitional interior, we've got neutrals being used very successfully. What makes this space feel casual is the imbalance of it, the asymmetry. The sectional with the backdrop of the bookcases and the painting the two chairs in the foreground, not really having their counterpart in the background. So that gives us a sense of imbalance. Imbalance is more casual as well, but this is a very nice, elegant space done in neutrals and done in this sort of transitional modern style. This room is an absolute nightmare. And I'm showing it to you because are we using peppy, Happy colors? Yes. Are we using them well? No. So there's a lot of crimes going on in this room. The furniture arrangement is not the crime. The crime is the use of these colors together. It appears that this room is, is kind of the result of a marriage, if you will. So imagine one spouse coming in with that neutral crate and barrel sofa, that neutral pottery barn rug, and that neutral coffee table. And then the other spouse coming in with those court jester drapes, the turquoise chairs and the velvet wing chairs, trying to make it work. The, it's not just that the, it's not about the furniture styles going together because really any furniture style can, can cohabitate. It's just that the colors are so strange. They have tried to add variety to the neutral sofa by putting on all of those ethnic textile pillows and it doesn't work. I don't know who told them to paint the walls cobalt blue but they should, they should just block them on every social media account because that was a terrible idea. Yeah. Um, there's no rhyme or reason to the blue being on the wall, let alone those red and white drapes. And as mentioned before, should you take your drapery rods to the ceiling to create the illusion of height? Yes, but the walls are so intense and the drapes are so busy that it doesn't make the window look bigger, it actually makes the window look smaller. If the walls were lighter to match the window casing, it would create the illusion of height, but because the walls are so dark, it just makes the window look even whiter and brighter. 
And in this instance, because we have the front door right next to the window, I would have kept the drapery rod at the same height as the front door, again, for unity, because all this is doing is creating a stair-stepped effect up to the ceiling. So you have the door, then you go up another step to get to the top of the curtain rod, then you go up another step to get to the top of the fireplace. So the room is not arranged, or rather the wall is not arranged well in that way. I think this room could be greatly improved if they just got rid of the blue walls and probably those drapes and those pillows on the sofa, because again, they're not fooling anybody. Um, anyway, so this is a bad room with lots of color. So don't do this. Here, a neutral formal dining room. Formal spaces do work nicely with neutral palettes, but again, anything goes, honestly. But here we have a formal arrangement and then a formal color scheme with these really lovely warm silvers and platinums and creams being used on the walls and furniture. Here, a more contemporary interior, again, being done with neutrals. Furniture is a formal arrangement, the traditional table and six chairs, but they are more contemporary, kind of a, a Bauhaus deco looking arrangement. The walls are white. We have lots of reflective surfaces in the frames and the chrome and the mirrors. So that gives us a lot of points of light bouncing around. The room doesn't necessarily have an air of formality to it because it does have a casual arrangement of art. But here we have a contemporary style of interior done in that neutral color palette, which is good for dining rooms. In this image, a warm, multicolored palette in a dining room. The furniture is formal. We've got some very formal um, English Georgian chairs, um, some antique Renaissance chairs at the head of the table, the crystal chandelier, which is also the Georgian, all the moldings, which are very classical. So the room has a lot of traditional elements, but they have bent the rules a little bit by doing a very casual art arrangement, making it feel a little more informal kind of taking the, the pretension out of the room. And then it's also this very beautiful dark green. I think it's a wool that's on the wall. So here we've got a dark cozy dining room. Although it is large, that table seats eight. Um, probably it would seat 10 if they had, if they pushed the chairs a little closer together. But here we're using color in a dining room. It still has a sense of formality, but it is a little more casual because not just the color is there, but also the arrangement of the accessories give it a, a more lived in feeling. Bedrooms and private areas and personal, um, bedrooms or private areas and personal preference should be the determining factor in the choice of color. Adjoining bathrooms most often coordinate. So here, a more contemporary, warm, modern bedroom neutrals and grays being employed, beautiful arrangement, beautiful furniture selections, gorgeous finishes. The marble on that fireplace is just fantastic. We have draperies to block out the light and give us a sense of privacy, but they're very tailored. They're not overwhelming. And this space is designed for an owner who has more of a modern sensibility. The room isn't cold, but Certainly it's, it's more contemporary. It feels more up to date. It doesn't have a historic sense to it, but a really elegant bedroom with lots of sumptuous finishes. And then here, a bedroom done in a very dark color palette. It has been proven that you sleep best in dark rooms. You also sleep best in cooler rooms, as in cooler temperatures. Not to say that the prior bedroom could not be darkened with the, the closing of those drapes. They probably have blackout linings on them. But if you want to sleep very well, then you should have a bedroom that is darker. And that might even come down to the darker colors of the palette you use. So in this interior, we have dark blues and greens and grays, dark furniture, dark draperies. So this is a room that you could theoretically fall asleep in very easily because it's dark in addition to closing the drapes. 
they say that even the blue or red light that's on your TV or DVD player or your Roku can keep you awake because that LED light is so intense. You can see it through your eyelids. And I think that that's true. I don't have a TV in my bedroom, but I think that that is a, a truth. I don't think that it's an exaggeration. And if you have a client that has trouble sleeping or that needs to fall asleep very quickly, you can use darker colors to kind of help them achieve that. Regarding color and architecture, the lighting across the outside of buildings changes continually. Exterior colors are therefore dynamic and their appearance depends on the local climate and relationship to the sun. Under a bright tropical sun, bright colors tend to wash out visually. So very strong colors may be used without an overwhelming effect. So here we have a a very bright pastel turquoise. And because the sun is shining and beating down on it, and because the environment is so bright, the turquoise doesn't appear as intense as it really is. In areas further from the equator with less direct and less frequent sunlight, such as often overcast parts of Europe, color appears more brilliant. So here in this, um, uh, streetscape from Holland, because we have such a gray, overcast weather quality, our colors will appear brighter even when they're not that bright. So the whites and grays and, and pinks that are used here will look even brighter against this gray backdrop. And that could be done, I think, with intention because maybe you want to make your, your building facade feel a little happier because you are surrounded by gray so much. Hues of walls and roofs will also affect absorption of solar energy. Hot climates often necessitate white walls and roofs to reflect heat away from the interior. Darker walls and roofs will help warm a building in a cold climate. Here we have an adobe structure, adobe being a indigenous type of architecture from the American Southwest. Not only was it made of mud brick, which could help to insulate the home, but it was also finished in a light colored plaster so that the rays of the sun would not absorb into the building, they would bounce off so that energy would bounce away and help keep the building cooler. What also helped the adobe homes stay cool was the thickness of the walls. Those adobe bricks are very substantial, very dense. And so in the hotter seasons, it would help to prevent the heat from radiating into the building. And in the colder seasons, it would absorb the heat from fires and help to insulate the room by having these walls that were radiating heat from the inside. So you can see how thick the adobe walls are on this interior. Even darker values may give a cooling visual impression if they are from the cooler range of hues, such as blues used in the magnificent tile work of Muslim mosques. Lustrous finishes were created by applying and firing metal oxides on the surface of initially glazed and fired tiles. This is not a Muslim mosque. This is the swimming pool from Hearst Castle, but all of the tile done in here in this sort of Greco-Roman grotto style has this beautiful cooling blue color. You can see there's variation within the blue. The tile also goes into the swimming pool. The photographer has used the surface of the pool's water to reflect the ceiling, but that blue goes all the way through. And this is an indoor pool, but having this blue around you almost gives you a very almost chilling feeling because the blue is cool, the water is cool, water is the color of blue and vice versa. And it's almost like being in an ice box. So if you're in a indoor pool that's this color, you, it's very, very cooling, especially when it's extremely hot outside. This pool is enormous and usually is left unfilled because of water conservation efforts in California. So if you went to Hearst Castle to see it, you would not be able to see it filled. Uh, but it's a beautiful indoor swimming pool, of course, because it was for William Randolph Hearst, the billionaire publisher. So he's going to have something gorgeous, but really a fantastic interior and gorgeous color. 
In addition to the geographical and climate considerations unique to architecture, aesthetic concerns also come into play. Throughout time, there have been two treatments of building exteriors. Use of the colors of nature or of the materials themselves or use of applied colors. The exteriors of great buildings in Egypt, Greece, South and Central America, and the Middle and Far East were often richly colored with applied paints and tiles. Here, a Victorian era paint watercolor of an Egyptian temple ruin, <clears throat> while the stone and assembly, or rather while the columns and architecture were made from stone or tile, they were also embellished on top of that. So here within these ruins and on these um, faded columns, we see the painted hieroglyphic motifs and the ornamentation of the column capitals with their plant-like and leafy shapes. And here, a reconstruction of a Greek temple facade. This is the pediment that would sit up at the top of the temple right under the roof line. If we were to go to Greece today, we would see all the temples were white. And we would assume, oh, they're all white temples. That's what they built during the Greek and Roman period. In reality, all of those figures and all of the architecture was brightly painted, almost to the point of being a little bit garish because of all those bright colors. But the artists and sculptors wanted them painted so brightly so you could see them from a distance. Because if you're looking up at the roof line, seeing these sculptures, you want to be able to identify them. So they'll be painted quite vividly. And here the interior of a mosque, the gold and blue tile adding luster, but also adding this beautiful um, symbolic color gesture. Within the Muslim faith, blue is the color of heaven or the heavens and gold is the riches of heaven. So we see a lot of blue and gold used in Muslim design. The tile itself adds a cooling effect because the tile is very cool. So in hotter areas, the interior of the mosque would be kept cool due to the use of the tile. The conservative no color approach to exteriors entered Western history with the Protestant Reformation when ostentatiousness was declared vulgar and inappropriate for spirituality. So here we have the interior of St. Peter's Basilica in Italy at the Vatican. And while this building was constructed during the late Renaissance, it received most of its embellishment during the Baroque period. So lots of gilding, lots of lavish color, lots of textiles. This baldacchino um, is made of cast bronze and was designed by Bernini. And it's quite a uh, a sumptuous decadent type of decoration for this church. Yet with the Reformation, which occurred, we had a introduction of the Protestant faiths, the Protestant religions, which chose to worship in a more humble environment. So in this simple church interior, we have no real applied color. It's just the color of the natural materials, the woods and the plaster um, and whatever simple paintings we might have on the wall. So it's not as decadent as the Catholic churches were becoming. And that was one of the reasons for this reformation. This sparse aesthetic culminated in 20th century international style, which celebrates the integrity of unadorned modern building materials, such as raw concrete, glass, and steel. Now, the international style came from the Bauhaus, which was a German art and architecture school. One of their headmasters was the architect Mies van der Rohe, who would immigrate to the United States and build in the international style. This is one of his buildings. This is called the Seagram Building, and this was built for the Seagram Company, which makes alcoholic beverages. And this was their headquarters. It is the, the new skyscraper of the time. If you look in the background, here's the Art Deco skyscraper. A little bit shorter than the new modern skyscraper that Van der Rohe designed. This was a revolution in architecture. Not only was the shape very minimal, but the construction was very simplistic. It was based on the support for the building being in the center, in the core of the building, 
rather than the walls carrying the weight of the construction. So the supports run through the interior of the building, which allows the exterior to be covered completely in glass. Glass could not support the weight of the building, but because the support system is inside, it allowed for the walls to be opened up with glass. So we call these glass curtain walls. So the architecture itself was revolutionary. The fact that the Seagram company also has this entire block that they can build on and Vandero chooses to only build on half of it was, was sort of a uh, indication of the, the direction of the international style, but also it was kind of a, um, a statement on the Seagram company itself. They had enough money to afford to give over some of the land just for the approach. So you can see we have this entry court with two fountains on either side. So it's a very beautiful approach to the building rather than the ones that are right up to the, uh, right up to the sidewalk that you have to kind of jump out of your cab to get into. But that's Van der Rohe's Seagram building. And he used a lot of industrial products, but he left them in their natural state. So glass, steel, marble, concrete. And he really let their natural finish be the color palette. So here's a view looking out towards the plaza in front. You can see very clean, modernist, minimalist architecture. And the international style would lead into the mid-century style. The famous interior at his Seagram building is the Four Seasons Restaurant. And it is still there today. People still want to dine there not just because it's a Van der Rohe interior, but also because the food's really good. Here is the bar area. And in the color images, you'll see the, the sort of colors come out, but again, he's using concrete, natural wood. So here in the bar, we've got a wood plank floor, wood paneled walls, steel window frames, leather, concrete down below, bronze and marble for the little drink tables. And then the draperies, the window coverings. This is to me just out of this world. I don't know how he thought of this. This isn't swagged fabric. This is actually swags of chain mail. It's, it's ball bearing chain mail. And it's completely dramatic. It's very sexy looking, but it's metal. And I think that's just such a brilliant idea. Here is the bar area. Um, the chandelier above is all done in bronze rods. Again, patinaed, allowing them to age and oxidize. So all of these materials are left in their natural state. And that is his color palette. So it's a color palette of nature, but it's also in a very contemporary modernist interior. Van der Rohe was also very luxurious in the materials that he would use. A lot of modernist designers of his generation were very brutal. They used a lot of concrete and hard edges. Van der Rohe used a lot of luxury finishes. So in this bathroom, he's used rosewood for the wall paneling. He's used marble for the floors and countertops. So this is his way of making a space feel more luxurious, making it feel more upmarket by using these very decadent materials. The international style coming from the Bauhaus was a style that was all about accessibility and affordability and bringing design to the masses because the Bauhaus felt that everyone deserved to have good design, but they also felt that sumptuous design that was seen, for instance, during the Baroque period is what caused a lot of civil unrest because it expressed who had money and who did not. And the Bauhaus was really a, a group of communists and socialists who felt that everyone should be equal. So we should be using the same materials for the wealthiest person and the poorest person. So they wanted to do away with these sumptuous finishes, but as it turns out, people really like them. So Van der Rohe mixed modernism with a little bit of decadence. Frank Lloyd Wright led the way to a different set of conventions in architecture. He denounced vivid chromatic hues as the, as the province of interior decorators and honored the earthy colors of nature 
in an attempt to make buildings blend with the land. One of Wright's earliest architectural movements was what he called the prairie style. And his prairie style homes were very horizontal. They had a lot of horizontal elements to make them seem lower to the ground. Even if they were a multi-storied structure, he would employ these horizontal elements so that the, the house would seem low slung to look as if it's part of the land. He called the style prairie after the prairie area that he grew up in. He grew up in the Midwest. And the prairie is very, very flat. It's farmland. So he wanted the homes to look like they came out of the prairie. So this is Falling Water, one of his famous homes built for the Kaufman family. This is out in Bear Run, Pennsylvania. It's out in the woods, as you can see. The family had this land and they used it as a campground up until the 1920s they just, when they decided they wanted to build a vacation home. So they called in Wright, he built Falling Water. It sits directly on top of an active stream. While this is romantic, it also has given the house a perpetual moisture problem. And the owner called it rising damp because of all of the water issues they have. Also, this is a flat roofed house. And this is in Pennsylvania, where not only does it rain, but it also snows and you also have ice. So all of Wright's flat roofed homes leak because there's nowhere for the water to run off. Of course, we have made modifications to help with drainage today. But when Wright built it, he didn't really have any thought towards weather. Um, so Mr. Kaufman also called this a seven bucket house because at one time there were usually seven buckets under leaks in the roof when it would rain or snow. So he was very advanced and very progressive, but some things he was a little ahead of his time on. So from the exterior, falling water is ornamented, if you will, with natural materials. Stones would be collected from the landscape to be employed on the facade, and he would use a simple sand-colored stucco to finish the rest of the house. The home looks like it belongs in the landscape. The same idea would be carried through to the interior with the use of stone found on site to create some of the supports. He would also use natural colors, um, lots of neutrals, and he favored one type of red, which he called Cherokee red, which was a sort of a burnt orange. And he used that a lot in his interiors. You'll notice the stone floor here. That is a natural stone deposit. He chose to build the house on the natural stone. He did not bring this in. This is the actual rock from the landscape. He did not move it. He built on it, which is very romantic and, and absolutely fantastic. However, you can imagine how cold it gets in that house because you're, you're on a rock in the environment. So there's also some heating issues here, but I believe the Coffin family used it most in the summer. So in the summer, that stone would help to keep the interior very cool. But in the winter, you could hang meat. It's an icebox. As far as his modernism, this does have some art deco elements in the radius curves of these um, light fixtures and accents. Steel frame windows, again, modernist ideas, built-in furniture as well, very contemporary, um, but a limited color palette. So that's also what Wright was about. He enjoyed natural colors. He wanted nature to be the inspiration. He was also inspired by Native American design and architecture. So there will be some elements of Native American in Wright's architecture. He wanted to be the first truly American architect because up to that point, most of the architecture that had been built in the United States was a replica of European. So French, English, um, German, it was all carried over by immigrants. And Wright wanted to be American. So in his inspiration and influences for his architecture, he cited that the first truly American architects were the Native Americans, the indigenous people. So he references a lot of their art and design in his work as kind of a tribute to what had come before. He worked with the warm colors of wood and local rock and eschewed paint using only a sand finished coating or a terracotta red, as I said, Cherokee red, along with golden orange when necessary. 
in his later years, he would build a home and school in Arizona, which he would, he would call Taliesin West. Pardon me, Taliesin East. Taliesin, no, Taliesin West. Taliesin East was back in Minnesota. That was his home back there. Because he had gotten to be elderly, the winters in Minnesota became very challenging. So he built a sister school to his architecture school in Arizona, and he had the nice desert climate. In Arizona, he's building in, in more of a mid-century style. He's still using natural materials. He's still using stone that's been found from the landscape um, and also very simple linear construction. But in his later years, he, he made a pilgrimage and his style evolved. But we're still using those natural colors of the landscape, which again ties the building to the terrain. Here's the interior of the great room of the school. This was the social area. So you can see his oranges, his yellows, um, and his very elegant geometry. And here's Taliesin East over in Wisconsin, just to show you this. This was his drafting room. So you can see all the drafting tables and the models. Um, the architecture is somewhat similar with that angled roof. And we are also using natural finished material. That wood is raw. It might have a clear coat on it, but it's been left in its raw state. The floors are concrete. So it's very organic in that feeling, but the lines are very modernist. And imagine taking an architecture class in a room like this. Just fantastic compared to the white boxes that we have to learn in today. A very different reaction to the international style is manifested in the eccentricities of what is called postmodern architecture. In it, no one style predominates, but versions range from the romantic to the playful and often involve exploration back into the world of applied exterior color. So the postmodernist movement emerged in the late 1970s and continued into the mid 90s. It was originally an Italian style that began as the Memphis movement, and later it would be called postmodern. It was called postmodern because those scholars that were naming architectural styles had already named something modern. And so the problem became, okay, well, we've already got something modern. What do we call something that comes after modern? And so they decided on postmodern. And now we've got lots of other other names for architectural styles. Um, Frank Lloyd, not Frank Lloyd, right? Frank Gehry is considered to be a neo-baroque architect. If we look at his Disney concert hall, they consider that neo-baroque. Um, so the postmodernist group was very amusing. They did not take themselves seriously. They knew how to construct architecture, but they were very playful with color. They were playful with form. Postmodernism really references the past in a lot of its design. So in this facade, this fountain facade, we have a reference to classical architecture with the columns and the arches, but it's all a facade. And it's painted very playfully in yellow and black and red. And it's meant to be eye-catching and humorous. It's architecture that has a sense of humor. And today, especially, our, so many of our architects are so serious and they are so um, self-aware that the postmodernist movement was kind of nice because you suddenly had these architects that had a sense of humor. You know, they didn't take everything so seriously. Everything was not some big treatise or theory on art. So think of it as the pendulum swinging the other direction. And they really did have fun with color. Here is the, um, a hotel that Frank Gehry designed for Walt Disney World. And it's referencing pyramids. It's referencing renaissance dolphins on the end and this one has that great 80s color scheme of like a verdigris patina blue green mixed with pinks and terracottas so this is very postmodern also notice the grid of windows that's also a postmodern um sort of hallmark is this grid effect but here's 80s postmodern design by american frank Gehry, who was postmodern then he became neo-baroque as his style changed. 
And then in Burbank, California, we have the Disney Animation Studios. Postmodern referencing a Greek temple with its columns and its shape, but also referencing Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And Snow White and the Seven Dwarves was Disney's first full length film. It wasn't just a little short cartoon. And it really was wildly successful and it, it gave Disney Studios the money to expand. So if you think about Greek and Roman temples being devoted to gods of the, uh, the culture, within the Disney culture, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves were sort of the, the deities that allowed the, the company to, to expand. So here we've got the Seven Dwarves acting as the columns, the support for the building. And as far as the color scheme goes, again, we have this wonderful 90s color palette of the pinks and the oranges and the, the, the blues and greens in a very whimsical architectural environment. And as far as interiors go, here is a postmodern interior. Now, this is the home of a collector of postmodern. So a postmodern interior would probably have looked even more colorful, but this is very colorful to the point of being cartoonish, not just childlike, but cartoonish. The postmodernists loved color blocking. They loved pastels. So you'll see a lot of those nice pastels used here. They also loved modern finishes like aluminum as well as laminate finishes. So that bookcase in the background, that red thing with the yellow drawers, that's covered in laminate. That's not painted, it's plastic laminate. So their furnishings and some of their buildings have a childlike quality to it. It almost looks like building blocks or tinker toys that have been put together to create these pieces. Um, very whimsical, certainly a specific taste, when I was in design school and I was learning about postmodernism, when I saw this, it reminded me of Pee Wee's Playhouse because I grew up watching Pee Wee's Playhouse on TV and I realized, oh my gosh, Pee Wee lived in a postmodern house. And since it was a program for children, it made sense. If you want to see a movie with postmodern interiors, you should watch the film Soap Dish, which stars Sally Field and Kevin Klein. It takes place at a television studio, which is done in the postmodern style. So this is the office of Carrie Fisher's character seen below, and it's very postmodern with its color, the giant ruler, that weird furniture. The, for some reason, Matisse comes in during the postmodernist period to like a revival of Matisse's work. So she's got some Matisse's behind her. But this is a great movie if you want to see postmodernism in a fairly realistic way, because this was filmed during that period where postmodernism was sort of the height of design. So hopefully this lecture has given you some insight in how designers use color and how it can be used functionally, but also emotionally. Oftentimes interiors will present us with challenges and interior design is all about problem solving. And sometimes the solution can be as simple as changing the color or selecting a certain element or area to highlight. So you can bring balance and proportion and order back into a space.